Listen guys, I know, it's been a year and a half, I, I understand. I'm about as consistent with finishing cut content series as Madhouse is with making season 2s. But I'd promise that next season will follow a strict weekly timeline just like ReZero did. Hopefully. In any case, the season finale of Shield Hero wasn't at all how it should have been, especially regarding the final fight between Naofumi and Glass. What started out as a rather faithful adaptation quickly diverted into a streamlined one-on-one. -on -one. This was supposed to be a very tense and engaging team battle all the way through, but instead the anime left out some of the most climactic and important components, including some very crucial information regarding Glass. So let's finish off Season 1 of Shield Hero and take a look at how the season finale should have been. Let's begin. Episode 25, The Rising of the Shield Hero, covering several chapters from Volume 5, 6, and 10 of the Light Novels. But for now we're mainly going to focus on the events from the end of Volume 5. Volume 10 related mostly to the rebuilding of Raftalia's village, something that's more of a standalone topic that doesn't bear much relevance until Season 3. And the stuff from Volume 6 will work better if we used it to lead into Season 2. So it's best to just focus on the final battle with Glass and the intermission that comes after. Starting things off with Glass's sudden appearance, the ensuing 3v3 did begin in a way that was similar to the novels. As we saw, the main essence was that Glass had realized the danger of facing off against the Soul Eater shield alone. That's why she decided to bombard Naofumi with a bunch of combo attacks instead. But when those attacks failed to pierce his defenses, Naofumi thought that perhaps he could switch to the offensive. He wanted to figure out why it was that Glass was so afraid of his Soul Eater shield. Which brings us to the point where the anime completely branches off and does its own thing. You see, the individual fight between Glass and Naofumi never actually happened. Instead, the team battle continued all the way to the end. So after Glass failed to penetrate Naofumi's barriers, she began to grow more and more impatient as it became apparent that she wouldn't be able to handle him as easily as she did last time. This was a tell that Naofumi made sure to take advantage of. So what he did was put up yet another shooting star shield barrier for her to focus on. Not only would this cause her to use more SP, but it would also make her more anxious since she was making little to no progress towards her goal. This was all with the intent of leading her towards a single moment. A moment that Naofumi was anticipating which would allow him to begin his counterattack. You see, he knew that Glass would keep putting out attacks until his barrier was broken. He also knew that her increasing frustration would make her want to use one of her stronger attacks the moment the barrier went down. That was the moment Naofumi was waiting for. So when the barrier finally broke, Naofumi immediately charged Glass with Philo. He figured that they would be able to catch her as she was preparing to cast her next ability. And that's exactly what happened. They were able to stop her mid-attack and prevent her from swinging her fan, allowing Naofumi to close the gap and perform a rather clever combo of his own. Since Philo was the first one to attack, Naofumi waited for Glass to attack her back before putting up an airstrike shield barrier between them. This made Glass unable to dodge the barrier's sudden appearance. So Naofumi then used Chain Shield to immediately swap that barrier with the Soul Eater shield, forcing Glass to aggro the shield that she'd been trying to avoid. It was while watching her panic in the presence of it that Naofumi finally pieced together that this was her direct weakness. He determined that she was highly vulnerable to attacks that drained SP, but not in the way like how it counters the other heroes. No, the effects of Soul Eat were much more dire to her specifically, the reason for which relates to a very important fact about her that was excluded from the anime. You see, Glass's existence isn't a corporeal one. She doesn't possess a physical body like how Tadis or Lark do. Instead, her existence is much more similar to that of a spirit. What this meant was that not only did Naofumi's shield hard counter every one of her close quarters attacks, but Raftalia also now held one of the strongest weapons that could be used against her. Yep, that's right. Raftalia's magic sword was the trump card Naofumi needed in order to bring this battle to an end. Remember, the illusion blade wasn't one intended to do any physical damage. What it can do though is cut through things that don't have a material existence, making it the perfect weapon to use against glass. So Naofumi yelled for Raftalia to use that sword then had her charge straight towards Glass with everything she's got. When Lark tried to intervene, Philo made sure to block his attack and keep him busy, allowing Raftalia to continue her charge as Naofumi followed closely behind. Tidis then attempted to slow her down by creating a wall of fire, but Naofumi managed to negate its effects with yet another barrier. 
So now it was only Glass and Raftalia. Since Glass had encountered Raftalia in battle before, she was able to easily predict the path that Raftalia's blade was going to take, preemptively raising her fan to block it much like how she did the last time. But this time there wasn't any physical blade to defend against. Instead, all Glass could see was the hilt of a sword. As it turns out, Raftalia had predicted that Glass would block in the exact way that she did. So to counter it, she held back her magic power right before the blade was about to make contact with Glass's fan. This made the illusion blade disappear and gave Raftalia the chance to pivot and reposition herself. The moment she knew she had a clear shot, Raftalia focused all her magic energy back into the blade, piercing Glass right through her stomach. The more she resisted, the more energy Raftalia would put into it and the deeper the blade would go. It was moments later that the blade itself began to sparkle, followed immediately after by an explosion of blinding light. Glass's screams were the only thing that could be heard as Naofumi shielded Raftalia from this magical explosion. Now, you'd think that something like this would have been enough to be the finishing move, but once all the smoke had cleared, Glass could still be seen standing and ready to fight. It was very clear that she had taken a significant amount of damage though. Despite Glass's willingness to continue the fight, Naofumi knew that he had finally managed to back her into a corner. Even if they did use some sort of restorative magic on her, she would still be exhausted from having all her energy drained. Not to mention that the Wrath Shield and Iron Maiden were still available options. So things were actually looking pretty good for Naofumi. But Glass wasn't ready to give up just yet. She knew that if they were to leave Naofumi for a second time, then he'd only become stronger than he already was right now. Having to face Naofumi again was the worst possible outcome. So Glass used what little energy she had left to attack as best as she could. But her strikes weren't even strong enough to break past Raftalia. Right as she was about to get caught in the Soul Eater Shield trap yet again, Lark jumped in to take the damage instead. He was very much aware that the situation they were in was pretty dire. So it left him with no choice but to pull out a trump card of his own. Using his scythe, Lark produced multiple vials of the soul healing water that we see in the anime, opening all of them then pouring each of their contents onto glass. Now, for any normal hero, this only would have worked to regenerate a little bit of SP. But for someone like Glass, this was much more like an instant recovery potion. Only a few vials were needed to make her look more healthy and powerful than she'd ever been before. Clearly, the soul healing water was working as a massive power-up. Once her recovery was complete, Glass briefly lifted her head and gazed at her opponents with a very grave expression. So much so that Raftalia and Philo found themselves to be unable to move due to the sheer terror it instilled in them. In only an instant, Glass was on her feet again. In the next, she was right in front of Naofumi. To everyone else, it looked as if she had just teleported from where she was. But really, it was just because no one could keep up with how fast she was moving. Luckily, Naofumi's shield was already in position to block. But the power of this attack was so strong that it felt as if the impact was going to break the shield itself. Had Raftalia or Philo been the ones hit by it, then Naofumi knew for sure that they wouldn't have been able to survive. What worried him the most, though, was the fact that they weren't even fast enough to avoid it. If Glass suddenly decided to switch her focus to them, then there wasn't much that he could do to stop her. That's just how strong she was now. I mean, the aftershock of her attacks literally parted the ocean. So this new powered-up Glass was by far the strongest opponent that Naofumi had ever faced before. It left him with no choice but to bring out the Wrath Shield. As he countered Glass's next attack with his flames, he found that she was slowly becoming more and more exhausted again but it didn't help that he was reaching his limit as well. The fact that Glass was even capable of withstanding the flames from his self-burning curse didn't make the situation seem very winnable at all. It made him think that perhaps he needed to resort to using the Iron Maiden. In the meantime though, Glass continued to attack with numerous more armor-piercing abilities, each one continuing to split the ocean behind her target. The thing is, this wasn't an offensive that she could sustain forever. The constant counter of flames damaging her over time, plus the sheer amount of energy it required to produce the attack, only meant that she would eventually die from energy loss or even excessive damage. Even so, Glass made it clear that she wasn't going to stop until Naofumi was dead. So that was all Naofumi needed to hear in order to commit himself to using Iron Maiden. As he was about to activate Shield Prison, that's when he noticed that the Queen was standing right behind Glass. 
she had used the cover of Naofumi's flames to sneak onto the battlefield. Once she was close enough, she used her magic to pull a barrel from the ocean and land it right in front of her. It was then that Naofumi immediately understood what it was that the queen was trying to do. So he quickly jumped to Raftalia and Philo then activated Shooting Star Shield to protect them. As soon as the barrel landed, the resulting explosion created a mist of red that no one could see through, giving Naofumi a brief moment to formulate his next plan. He knew that Iron Maiden and Blood Sacrifice were still available options, he just wasn't sure on who to use it against. By the time that Glass had cleared the mist with her fans, Naofumi had decided to focus Lark. His attacks were by far the trickiest to deal with. So, if he had the option to remove someone from the battlefield, then Naofumi felt it was the smartest to choose him. But trapping Lark in shield prison wasn't as easy as he expected. The barrier wasn't strong enough to withstand attacks from Glass on the outside and Lark on the inside. Their combined damage would just break it before he could activate the entire ability. So that meant the only remaining option was to use Blood Sacrifice. At least by doing that, he knew for sure that he'd be able to take out both Glass and Lark at the same time. Right as he was about to start the attack, a timer suddenly appeared in his field of view. It showed that only a minute remained before the enemies in front of him would get to escape, which was actually the exact same thought that Glass was having as well. Both didn't want to let the other get away, but now Fumi wasn't actually sure if stopping them here was truly the best option. As he continued to think it over, Glass had already decided to charge in for one final attack, making Lark have to step in and hold her back. Unlike Glass, he understood that any more fighting now would just be pointless. So it was as Glass tried to break free from his grip that Lark leaned in and whispered something into her ear. Whatever it was, it must have been something pretty important, because not only did Glass look at him afterwards with an expression of shock, but it's also what convinced her to make her retreat. Now, Fumi wasn't sure what it was he said, but he didn't like the fact that she was able to become so calm because of it. It made it seem like they had some sort of plan for next time. So that was the moment now Fumi knew that he couldn't let them escape. But by the time he was in range to attack, it was already too late. Tidys, Lark, and Glass had already escaped to beyond the rift, finally bringing an end to this epic battle. Keep in mind though that none of the stuff about Glass's world was ever shown to now Fumi. At this point in the novels, he still didn't know why they were attacking. Which is why when we get to the epilogue, there was quite a bit of speculation regarding what their true intent was. Now, when everyone was back at the Kalmyra Islands, the Queen and the other heroes were meeting to discuss the events of the Third Wave. First, the Queen wanted to know why now Fumi didn't inhale the mist produced by the Rukulo barrels. Reason being that, aside from making people drunk, this fruit also increased the user's magic power and concentration. Had Naofumi consumed some of the mist, then he could have used any of his abilities an infinite number of times. Unfortunately, that wasn't a side effect that he was aware of. Even if he was, he wasn't so sure that killing these heroes from another world was even the right thing to do. He wasn't 100% certain that they were actually the bad guys. Sure, they came from the other side, but what even was it that existed over there? Before he could judge them as enemies, he first needed to understand where they came from. That's when Naofumi began to theorize. Perhaps Glass and the others were actually trying to invade with their army of monster soldiers. Or maybe they had something to gain by killing the heroes. If that was the case though, then Naofumi needed to know more about what that benefit was. The only other theory was that perhaps something would happen once all the other heroes were gone. It made Naofumi wonder what the result would be if the waves actually succeeded in destroying the world. But that was something that would only ever happen if he was to die. So there wasn't any particular way to be sure about what they wanted, at least until they had to face them again. But if there truly was going to be a next time, then Naofumi knew he'd have to rely on the power of the other heroes. He wasn't sure he'd be able to hold off Glass again all by himself. The only problem with that was that the other heroes were simply too weak to be considered useful. Naofumi couldn't even see them to be much stronger than that of a typical adventurer. Sure, they had access to special skills, but that didn't mean that they possessed actual power. Had they been as powerful as Naofumi, then there was absolutely no way that they would have lost to Glass. So it was here that Naofumi was convinced that he would have to cooperate with the other heroes. The only problem was convincing them to do the same. In any case, that was pretty much the end of the Kalmira arc. The rest of the episode covers the intermission arc from Volume 6 and the stuff that I mentioned earlier from Volume 10. 
of which the main content skipped revolved around a meeting intended to discuss how useless the other heroes were. It's something that I'll go over in the video that I plan on using to lead us into Season 2. Until then, this video marks the end of the Season 1 Shield Hero Cut content series. I really am sorry that I took over a year and a half to finish it, but now that I'm focusing on tightening up my release schedule, this shouldn't be the case for Season 2. I also really want to thank you guys for all the continued support. Seeing all the comments about how much you guys love this series and all the other ones really does mean a lot to me. So, seriously, thank you.